Good morning, good morning, good morning. If you guys want to grab a seat, that would be awesome. How's everybody doing this morning? There we go. That was um, quite a response. I'm, I'm in for it. So, um, yeah, my name's Christian. If I haven't gotten a chance to meet you yet, and I'm excited this morning, we are wrapping up our series. Um, This is us living as God's people even now. And we have been talking about over the past few weeks um, the way that God is at work among his people, right? And and not just how God is at work, but how we respond to that work that he's doing. What does this actually mean for our lives? And so we've talked about how God's people is the place where God himself dwells, um, especially most fully among us collectively. We talked about how Um, God kind of provides this family for us here, and he satisfies these deep longings that we have in our hearts to to be fully known and to be fully loved. We talked about how in the midst of God's people, it's the place where he demonstrates his power, right? Where um, we are able to walk together despite all of our differences, despite um, our brokenness, we're able to walk together as a family, um, and where we're able to See the Lord bring about and cultivate these good fruits, things like love, joy, peace, all of those kinds of things that are big and beautiful and powerful. And so we know that we could have kind of taken a, a, a whole series and unpacked each of these things a lot more fully. Our hope has been to just kind of lay the foundation so that the Lord could continue to build, certainly on Sundays, but also um, as we're walking together as a family So just kind of having this foundation, but there's one sort of foundational piece that um, we haven't talked about yet, and so let me pray for us, and we will jump into that. Holy Spirit, we praise you this morning. Please give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to receive the things that you have for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So a few years ago, um, my wife Meg and I, we got the chance to visit Joshua Tree National Park. And uh, it's in Southern California. And Joshua Tree, it sits at um, the the sort of intersection of the Colorado and the Mojave Desert. You're going to see a picture of it up here on the screen. But it's these rugged mountains, um, these sort of wide open desert plains, and then these big kind of rock piles. These are just all over the place. Um, And people come really from all over the world to climb these rocks. And so it's a place that has just, it just grabbed me. Like I've, I, um, it just has grabbed hold of my imagination. I love this place. But while we were there, Meg and I, um, we did this really short hike out to this place called Barker Dam. And Barker Dam is very different from the rest of Joshua Tree. Um, there, it's just this little oasis in the middle of the desert. And this small pool, you can kind of see like, that's pretty much all there is to it. It's only a couple feet deep, but this small pool of water changes everything in this area immediately around Barker Dam. There's more green here probably than anywhere else combined in the park. It's a place of life and flourishing where um, we, there, there are kind of all kinds of animals, bighorn sheep, um, there are all kinds of birds. It's probably the one place where you might need to use some bug spray in the whole park. But if you, um, as you kind of walk back to the car, it's only about half a mile back to the car, and as we were walking, like, it's not an exaggeration to say it only took a few steps away from this place before you were back in the middle of the desert. And it was just crazy how stark a contrast it was between these two places, but just a truly incredible place. And I think that, you know, as we've been talking about life in the midst of God's people, we may begin to, to start to get a sense that the church is kind of a little bit like Barker Dam, right? We might start to think of the church as like this oasis in the middle of the desert. We've described how in the midst of this group of people, there is abundant life flourishing. It's the, the place where our thirsts are quenched, the place where we get to come into contact with God's power up close and personal. It's the place of God's blessing, And so being a part of that is beautiful and and rich and amazing. But when we lift up our eyes to the horizon, we don't have to look too far to see the desert, right? We might feel like we're a part of God's people and therefore we're all set, but all around us, there's desert. We see it in things like fear, lack, scarcity, 
uh, difficulty, pain, injustice, suffering. And it's not that we're immune to those things here in, in this family. Of course, that's not the case. But we believe and we've seen that in the midst of this people, God uses one another to heal our wounds, to, to ease our burdens, to provide for our needs, and to just bless us abundantly. But it begs the question, what about everyone else? What about this desert that surrounds us? What about the rest of our world? We know that God so loves the whole world, right? And so how does this blessing that we know in, in the midst of God's family, how does it get out into the desert, right? How does it get out into the world? And what does that have to do with us? Um, this morning, we're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 47. And this is uh, Ezekiel. He was a prophet, um, just really a messenger from God to his people. He lived a few hundred years before Jesus. And in this passage we're going to read today, Ezekiel is having a vision. God is kind of giving him this vision. It's been going on for several chapters at this point. This is sort of the culmination of it. But in this vision, Ezekiel is, um, God is leading him around the city of Jerusalem. Ezekiel is not actually in Jerusalem at the, at the time, but God is showing him things in Jerusalem. And what this, this vision is meant to communicate to God's people, and remember at the time, God's people is just this one ethnic group, just the Israelites. Um, we know that the Spirit is going to kind of fling open the door for anyone to come in, but at the time, it's just the Israelites. And, and what God is trying to do with this vision is to give them a picture of how he's going to work in the days ahead, how he is going to be at work in the future. And so it's a vision that anticipates the way that God actually works in our world now. He's kind of pointing them toward that as this sign of hope, but as a result, it's instructive for us. This is how the Lord is at work now. So let me start reading for us in Ezekiel 47, 1. It says, Then he, and that's God, then he brought me back to the entrance of the temple. There, water was flowing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. And the water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Now, we're going to stop here for a second because there are several things we want to just kind of lay the groundwork for this vision that Ezekiel is going to describe to us. So the first thing is that Ezekiel, he's in Jerusalem, and God has, has led him around. He's led him to the temple. And we have talked a lot about the temple over the course of the last few weeks, right? We talked about how the temple was the, the building in Jerusalem where God's presence dwelled in the Old Testament. But we've also talked about how in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul gives us this picture that says that the temple is not this building anymore, but the Spirit has come and fused himself to each of us. And then that he says he is building us up together into a temple, into this dwelling place for God. And so when we see this word temple now, that's the thing that we start to think, right? We think about this place, this, this people collectively, the place where God himself dwells in our midst. This is the way that God is kind of using this in this passage here. Now, there was no water source like this at the temple. In fact, they had to build um, pools around the temple in order to get water to be used in the temple. And so what Ezekiel is seeing here is God showing him something that is new, something that is meaningful for what he's going to do down the road. We're going to kind of skip um, a few verses here because the way that Ezekiel describes what he's seeing is a little wordy and confusing. But basically what happens is um, God takes him out of the city and he looks up and he sees the water coming down from the temple, flowing out of the city and east of Jerusalem. And east of Jerusalem, there are two really important things. First, there's the Arabah, which literally just means desert. And you don't have to go very far to find it. It is right out there. There's going to be a picture of it on the screen. And you thought Joshua Tree was dead. This place is like there's nothing, you know. It is brown. This is the desert. If you keep going through the Arabah, you get to a place called the Dead Sea, which, you know, is got, has gotten its name because it's so salty that nothing can live there, right? This is where the river is going to flow that we're going to see uh, Ezekiel describing here. And so I'm going to read the passage, but um, we're going to keep this picture up on the screen. And what I want us to do is to try and imagine as um, I'm reading this thing that Ezekiel is seeing playing out in this place, okay? So I'm going to pick it up in verse 6. It says, Then he led me back along the bank of the river, 
As I came back, I saw on the bank of the river a great many trees on the one side and on the other. He said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes into the Arabah. And when it enters into the sea, the sea of stagnant waters, a.k.a. the Dead Sea, the water there will become fresh. Wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live there, and there will be many fish once these waters reach there. It will become fresh, the Dead Sea will become fresh, and everything will live wherever the river goes. People will stand beside the sea from En Gedi to Eneglium, that's the northernmost point and the southernmost point of the Dead Sea. It will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be of a great many kinds, like the fish of the Great Sea, that's the Mediterranean. But its swamps and marshes will not become fresh, they will be left for salt. On the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not, will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary, from the temple. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. It's one of the most powerful pictures that we get in the scriptures. This is what the Lord is doing in the desert, bringing life to a place like this, trees sprouting up, fish swimming, there's food, there's abundance, there's flourishing in a place like this. And it's powerful. He says, even this place, this, this, this metaphor of like the dead sea, the deadest of the dead, where there is no life, even there, I am bringing my new life. I am bringing flourishing. I am bringing my blessing. But what we have to remember about this is at the very beginning of the passage, where does the water come from? From the temple, right? He wants to do this kind of work through his people, through us. And so as God has extended to us, we've been talking about all these different ways that he's lavished his blessing upon us over the course of the last few weeks, as God extends that blessing to us, he intends us to turn around and extend it to the world around us, that as, as his blessing flows to us, it would flow out into the places that we find ourselves. And, and Jesus, he references this image in John chapter 7. He says, um, out, of, uh, out of my people will flow streams of living water. And so there is hope for the desert of our world. Even as hopeless as it may seem at times, as dead as it may seem at times, for the Lord is at work, even in the most dead places, bringing it all back to life, restoring goodness the way that he always intended it to be. And he wants to do that through us. And so you see all of these amazing things that we've been talking about over the course of the last few weeks. They were never meant to be contained here. The church is not an oasis. It's not this place where we sort of gather around and we just like, man, this is so great here. We have everything we need. But it was always meant to flow from us out into the world. That's why we say every week here as we, as we gather, as we've been blessed, go now and bless the world. The Lord lavishes his grace and blessing upon us, certainly because he loves us, but also for the sake of this place for the sake of these people, so that his blessing can flow to our campus and onto our town, to the people in our classes, to our neighbors, to our roommates, to our friends and our coworkers. This is the Lord's intention for us. And so all these things we've been talking about, he wants to take those same things, family, connection to him, those fruits of the Spirit he wants, that he offers to us, he wants to take those things and extend them out into the world that does not yet recognize that he is Lord. Now, when we say something like that, there probably, um, when we think about what that might look like, the first thing that probably comes to mind is like, well, yeah, he's going to use us to help people see um, how they might be able to enter into a relationship with him, right? Salvation. Of course, that's a piece of it. That's massive. But the Lord's blessing, as we have seen, goes far beyond that, right? He wants to bring family, healing, provision for needs, peace among enemies, comfort in the midst of fear, lifting up the marginalized and the oppressed and the poor. This is what his blessing looks like. His heart 
And his plan has always been that his blessing would flow through us out into the world, out into the desert that we see around us. And so this is a huge piece of what it means for us to be God's people. We're the ones that he's using to bring that blessing. The desert is not beyond hope. And so as we bask in the light of just how much the Lord has blessed us, absolutely, we hold on to that. We also take up this calling to be used by God to bless our world. And so this week, may we present ourselves to the Lord as a family for him to use us to extend that blessing out onto our campus and into our town. And I have a couple of questions that we might be able to just consider to kind of help us get going with this. Again, this is just a start, but to help us get going. And so first, as you look around you, where do you long to see God's, uh, where do you long to see God bring new life? Those things that we mentioned earlier, like fear or, um, or lack and scarcity or difficulty, struggle, injustice, all of these things, where do you see those kinds of things that the Lord, we know, desires to bring his blessing. And certainly, we could probably think about like the headlines that we see on the news and all of those things, things that are happening around the world. But what we have to recognize is that the Lord has sent us to this place. This, we're this little subset of his people, right? Because he intends to use us to bring his blessing into this place. And so as we're asking ourselves these questions, let's think about here, our campus, our town. Where does God's blessing need to flow? Maybe there are people, specific people or specific situations coming to your mind, folks who are wrestling with things like depression or anxiety or addiction or loneliness, people who are walking through financial difficulties, people who are struggling with schoolwork, all these things. There's there's nothing kind of off the table, but as they come into our mind, We want to begin just lifting them up before the Lord, asking the Lord, God, move in this place and use us. Use us there. This is where we have to begin. This is where this blessing kind of begins flowing beyond just this place and out into the desert. Because what we have to recognize, and and this happens as we're praying, is that we're not the ones who actually do the, the bringing of dead things back to life, right? We have a role in that, but only the Lord can do that. And so we, we're acknowledging that as we pray, God, we need you to come. We know your heart is for this place, for these people. We need you to come, and we know that you're the one that does the heavy lifting. And so we ask that his blessing would flow. We ask knowing that he, in, in full confidence, that he is for the flourishing of our campus and our town. I'd really encourage you this week to check out one of our communal prayer times. This is a great way for us to begin kind of lifting some of these things up to the Lord, the people that are coming to our minds, the situation that are coming to our minds, and to do that together. Um, We have the times uh, 8.30 p.m. on Tuesdays online, 4 p.m. on Wednesdays at the loft, and uh, I guess 8 a.m. on Thursdays at the loft. But these give us a great chance to kind of come alongside one another and not just say, okay, God has kind of laid this, this person on my heart. He's brought this person to my mind. So I just got to go do it. We, we recognize we're meant to do this together. This gives us space to bring these people in these situations before the throne together and to join in with one another in the things that the Lord is doing. And oftentimes, the Spirit brings these things to our minds specifically because He wants to use us in those places. And so as God brings those, those people and situations to mind, we, we can take it as a nudge, not just that God wants to, to work there, we know that, but as a nudge that he's, he's calling us, he's kind of laying those people on our hearts for the purpose of using us in that place. And so we ask ourselves kind of the second question, how is God asking you to participate in this work? Not as like a, I'm putting the team on my back, I got this, we're saving the world kind of thing. Of course, again, that's not, it's not the way that it is. But we, we just recognize that the Lord asks us to walk into, in some simple things. And those simple things he, he takes and uses in far greater ways. And so it could be that, you know, you're, you share some meals, have, have lunch together, um, study with these folks, spend some time just 
hanging out, invite to, to play uh, video games or to ride bikes or to an engaged group event. It could just be space even to listen or to help out with homework or offer a word of encouragement. These things are very simple. They're not kind of the, the most elaborate things in the world. And again, this is just the, the foundation, but we believe that the Lord uses them. And we also know that regardless of, of kind of where we are, how much experience we have with this, how much um, how, how mature we feel like we are in our faith, we all have a role in this. This is a family thing. So we don't have to feel like we have to have it all together. We don't have to feel like we have to be some sort of spiritual juggernaut. We just, um, God just asks us to be faithful, to ask him to move, and then to follow as he lays these people and these things on our hearts before us. And as we do, we get to witness and experience the resurrecting power of the Lord poured out here on our campus and in our town. This calling, it is a gift, it is a, an invitation to come in and work alongside our Father, to be a part of this resurrecting work of, of dead things coming back to life, of broken things being mended, to have a part in that, even as we know that the Lord does the heavy lifting, it is a joy for us to be a part of. It is part of our flourishing. And so we consider these questions. As you look around you, where do you long to see God bring new life? And how is God asking you to participate in his work? And again, this is just a start. We're going to keep going, of course. But if we're diligent and faithful to think through these questions, the Lord is going to continue more and more to bring his blessing onto our campus into our town, through us. And so as we have experienced God's abundant blessing here in his family, may we turn our eyes to the people and situations around us where God's blessing needs to break in. May the Lord take our prayers and our simple steps and just continue to build on this thing that he has been laying the foundation for the past few weeks. And through his people, through us, May his blessing flow into the deadest places on our campus and in our town, bringing new life and flourishing to the desert. Let's pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we, we're just grateful for this good news, God. We look out into our world and we... It's easy for us to be discouraged, frankly, Lord, or to feel this temptation to, to just say, oh, we, we've got it good here. We'll just, we'll just sort of hold on to this, God. But we are grateful for this calling, and we pray that as we go, you would lay on our hearts the people and the situations around us where you are longing to bring your flourishing in. Lord, may we be faithful to ask you to move. May we be faithful to take these simple steps. Pray these things in your name. Amen.